Okay. okay. Um, uh, only the memories of the now vanished communities with the names of Shiloh, Clifton, Allenhurst, Holliver, Wilson, Heath, and Happy Creek remain with us today. Located on North Merritt Island in that spit of land known as the Canaveral Peninsula, adventure-seeking pioneers and homesteaders once lived over 100 years ago. As recently as 1962, there were approximately 17 towns, settlements, and hamlets scattered across North Merritt Island and Canaveral, comprised of a reported 400 people, mostly farmers. Between the Indian and Banana Rivers, among the moss-covered oak trees and overgrown graveyards can be found remains of crumbling foundations and coquina driveways and shrubs gone wild from neglect. In the 1960s, the government purchased over 87,000 of these acres, including 40 miles of beachfront, to make way for NASA's Kennedy Space Center and the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Along with the displacement of the homesteaders, many descendants of the original pioneering families, houses, businesses, fish camps, and restaurants were bulldozed. The land was used for space port facilities, left as safety buffer zones, and some for nature conservation. Along the, although the locations of these ghost towns are within the government land boundaries, uh, some roads are open to public travel and lead to uh, prime hunting and fishing areas of the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. Today we're going to uh, have an insight of what was life, life was like growing up in these areas that were known as Shiloh, Clifton, and Allenhurst. Our guest today, Mrs. Frances Dreichel Braden Sherrick, will share with us what it was like growing up in the communities of Clifton, Allenhurst, and Shiloh, the people, places, and events that would make up the fabric of these communities that have been lost in time. The time period we'll be discussing will be approximately 1927 through the 1940s. And then uh, I guess when we start, I'll say, uh, uh, I'm not going to be on a mic, so uh, hmm. introduce yourself as... Uh, she should introduce herself. Okay. Can you, can you hear me at all on that? Yeah, yeah but you're off mic. It's, this would not be used for an edit. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Th this narration would be done later. And we would do the narration of you for the entire... Yeah, but I mean, can you hear me talking to oh, yeah. her? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's what I wanted to mm -hmm. know. <laughs> when, okay. When... Um, now... I'm Francis Threlko Braden Sharrick, and I was born in Titusville. And now, really, I originated in Kentucky because uh, I was born two months after my parents came down here. So I'll start with my parents. They originally came to the Shiloh area long before I was born when just my brother was there. They and the Ramers drove across the Rockies and ended up in Jacksonville and in coming from Jacksonville to the Shiloh area, it took one full day to drive in a Model T because they kept having blowouts because of the Coquina Rock roads. And so they, and also my brother and Dennis Raymer uh, was in the separate cars, but I think every time they stopped, they probably had a fight because they were boys and they were that age. But that was when my family came the first time. But then we went back, they went back to Kentucky where uh, they lived in the area where so many of these people from Shiloh had come from, the Livingston County area, and it was near the Ohio River. And I'm sure the rivers kept coming up so much over there, they practically were starving in Kentucky. So they came down here, and by this time there was a railroad that came, a passenger train, and they came to Titusville in 1925 uh, by train. And uh, two months or four months later, I was born over uh, on Canaveral Street, across from where one of the Carlisle families lived for years. 
but uh, we lived there. Mother probably just had a doctor here. I don't know because we didn't have hospitals or anything in Titusville. I laughingly tell everybody when I was born in Titusville, there were 400 people. Then when I graduated, there was 4,000. And of course, now there's 40,000. So anyhow, when I was two years old, that is when my dad bought a citrus grove, evidently just starting out because the pictures I've seen, it was, they were just waist high trees. And uh, we moved to Clifton. Now, a lot of people don't know where Clifton uh, is because it is between Allenhurst and Shiloh and didn't even go by that name very much. I don't think it was an official town, but that's what it was called anyhow. And uh, Dad bought a 10-acre orange grove, and this orange grove was in between the Mosquito Lagoon and the Indian River. Now, Allenhurst was a mile and a half south of us, and Shiloh was four miles north of us. And so this is where we moved into a house uh, that had just, didn't, hadn't been built too long, I don't think. There wasn't even a kitchen on it because at that time they were building their kitchens separate because people cooked in the kitchen and they had fires so often. <laughs> and uh, later they built a kitchen onto the back and put a big screen porch across, which is where we lived. And if you didn't live on a screen porch, you didn't live in Florida because the mosquitoes were so bad, you could put your hand up by the screen and you would end up with a, a handprint from the mosquito that came to them. So anyhow, at this time I was just two years old and the only way of making a living at that time was you either fished or you had an orange grove, but orange groves were also prone to freeze, and so the men needed something more than that to live on. So my dad bid on a rural mail route from Allenhurst to Oak Hill, and we later found the paperwork on this. He got the job from the government. See, the government didn't hire mail carriers. They let these jobs out on bids, and Dad got it for $700 a year, not a month, a year, and drove his own Model A, and he had an old Model A that he drove all of those years that he delivered the mail. He would, he would work the grove of a morning, and when Mother had to work in the packing house, I trailed her along behind him where he was using the tractor. And then we would get in the old Model A and go to Allenhurst where the mail, that's where Hall of the Canal is also. And that's where we, he started picking up the mail to go to the railroad station in Oak Hill. <clears throat> because up until that time, they had had more boats that delivered down the rivers. And uh, so anyhow, I usually went with Dad uh, until I started to school because uh, it was fun. <laughs> the people on, in the little stores there spoiled me and gave me candy. It's the only time I ever got candy. Anyhow, the next stop going up was Shiloh, and that is where one of the tailors of the Taylor family who owned so much of the groves up there, they ran a little general store and had the post office in it. And then we went on to Oak Hill, and that's where there was a little post office up there, and the mail was taken over and put on the train to go out and dad picked up the mail bags and packages off of the train and sorted it and then started back down to Allenhurst again. And along the way we would stop and uh, deliver mail to the rural mailboxes. And now his little, his little Model A originally had Isinglass windows, but of course they had long gone. When I remember, he just had canvas that he pulled up when it rained. And when it didn't rain, you let it down and let the wind blow through. Of course, you had to be careful because the mosquitoes liked that too every time you stopped. <laughs> you didn't stop very long. But anyhow, we delivered the mail at, to, on to Shiloh and to Allenhurst, and that was the end of his day. And 
What else did, uh, sometimes he used to pick up things for uh, When the people needed something from the store, they would leave Dad a little note in their mailbox, and uh, Dad would pick it up for them at Shiloh or Oak Hill and bring it back, because that was the only way of getting sugar and flour and coffee and things of that sort. Of course, we always had our own garden and orange grove and we had a cow and chickens so we didn't need a whole lot although behind us there was a black man named Moses who lived just in a shack back there and I know <clears throat> if it hadn't been for dad bringing him little stuff because he literally lived off of the land he had no family and uh, we but Times were so good then, you didn't worry about that. We kids would go sit on his stoop, and he would tell us all of these tales, which were so funny to us. But you didn't have to worry about molestation or anything like that, because he was just a good old black man that cackled and told us stories. <laughs> so uh, now our next door neighbors were the Wattons, who had a grove right next to us, and a lot of people knew him as Speedy Watton. And in later years, they had a a, a, uh, a fish camp there what called Watton's Place. But uh, right in that area, if anyone's driving up there, they'll see that is where the old cemetery for the Wattons was, where the family was buried. But right in back of our orange grove, there was a colored cemetery. Now the Jacksons and the Campbell colored people had acres on the Mesquite Lagoon where they had their gardens. And um, in fact, the, one of the Jackson women was a descendant of Dummett who established the Dummett Grove up there. <coughs> and uh, at one time they had a school there and I believe the school was made out of a, a wrecked boat that, <clears throat> that they used the lumber from. A lot of this was before my time, but I remember everybody talking about it. And then just up the gro road from us in another grove was Afton Davis's family. And now they were descendants of this Hawk Davis family that is in the Benz area. And there's, they even have a uh, bed and breakfast up there now that had one of their buildings had belonged to them. But uh, that was the Wattons and the Davises and the, well, the colored people, the Jacksons, and uh, all that lived right in Clifton. That was all there was to Clifton. But of course, when you went down to Allenhurst, there were the Tiggs, and that's where the Hallover Canal was. Originally, uh, it had been a mile south of that, but the canal that was dug, where the boats could go through, now, that's where we kids all learned to swim. I wouldn't let my kids swim there. Of course, I did find out years later that my daughter did, but I didn't know it until she was grown. <laughs> but anyhow, that was our recreation. The mosquitoes were too bad to play out, so we would go down and swim the hall over canal from one end to the other. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is there is a tide in a canal like that. When the ocean is going out, the water goes one way, and when it's coming in, it goes the other, and so you just get it whatever in and go the whole length of the whole of a canal swimming. And that was our recreation. <clears throat> and <clears throat> like I said, the Tiggs had a uh, fish camp there. But going on up to Shiloh, Shiloh uh, was the Taylors and the Mahans and the Keeblers and the Griffiths and... Uh, Oh goodness, uh, Patillas and uh, Treadwells, and like I said, there was there was wasn't but about oh ten families or 15, ten or fifteen families there, but they all uh, mostly it was orange groves that the, that they survived by, and then there was a s small school in Shiloh. And it was just a one, well, it was a two-room school to start with and went through the eighth grade. But in later years, they cut it back to just a one-room schoolhouse, and uh, it just went through the sixth grade. But we had a school bus that picked us uh, up and took us up to uh, Shiloh to school. And we went nine months at that time. School had gotten to the point that it was a full thing that way. 
and uh, we had whatever teachers we could get because it didn't pay much and it wasn't a very <laughs> pleasant place to live and the tailors usually would board these teachers just to, so they could get a good teacher because they believed in an education. And uh, now Mr. Pepper, which a lot of people in Titusville know that name because he eventually taught and was principal of different schools in Titusville, but he was also the father of Woodrow Clark, she is now, who's a member of the Baptist Church here, but uh, she's in her 90s. But anyhow, she was an Ashcraft, but she was Woodrow Pepper when she was little. Well, her dad was one of the teachers up there. And uh, different, uh, like I said, well, our books were what was left over that we could get. They weren't very good books, but we just had a, a reader and a spelling book. But when you sit in a one-room schoolhouse, you do your lesson, but you listen to everybody else's. So really and truly, you learn rather rapidly in a one-room school because you hear all of the other readers go on. And we behaved when we were in school, too. We knew better than not to because my mother always told me that <laughs> you get spanking at school, you get one when you come home. <laughs> Now, we had, in, in, at the school, they did have uh, electricity because it came from a generator that, you know, went that way. And our water was pumped up by a windmill. Now, in our house in Clifton, we did not have electricity. Uh, it was, I was 12 before they brought rural electricity up through that area. So we had the old-fashioned lamps, and that was it, period. And um, we were fortunate we didn't have to cook on a wood stove, which is terrible in Florida in the heat. We did have a gas stove. And we also had a gas iron that you pumped up to get heat with. And, uh, but we, we did not have any luxuries. I mean, there was outdoor privies, and you got out in the mosquitoes and fed the, all of those <laughs> animals that you had to keep to, to keep yourself living with and um, when you went to school what were some of the games that you played in school really we uh, made little hopscotch things on the ground and how you th throw a ball and play something come over you know and tag they really I don't even remember us having balls and bats and gloves. Now, some of the boys may have, but we as girls didn't have. When you were small, uh, what was Christmas like, and how did you celebrate Christmas? When you were okay, small? well, now, at, uh, at Christmas time, there was a community house there, and everything was done in this community house. We had our Sunday school and our church and whatever was going to go on. And Christmas Eve, they would put a great big tree up there that touched the ceiling with no decoration on it. The decorations were what gifts that everybody brought to be exchanged. Mostly it was pocket handkerchiefs, but you know, they make real pretty Christmas tree decorations. They'd tie them up to the tree and then they'd call your name and you'd go and get your gifts. And we also had some wonderful um, uh, programs. We would put on the manger scene and Mother Mary and sing all of the religious things. We were fortunate Mrs. Taylor could play the piano and we would play out our parts and people would come from Oak Hill and Titusville just to see our Christmas plays. And this was held at the community center? At the community center. That, uh, in fact, that is where I originally even found out about the Baptist Church. We had a minister that came here from this Baptist Church here in Titusville on a Tuesday night. His name was Dr. Austin, and he preached just for whatever contribution was given in the collection plate, and most of the time, I'm sure it didn't even come to five dollars. I doubt if it paid for his gas, <laughs> but uh, that's how I heard my first preaching services on Tuesday nights up there, and because we could not afford a preacher full-time in uh, in Shiloh. Now, Mr. DeWitt Taylor, he would have us like a uh, Easter service. He would preach that for us, and then we would have a big Easter egg hunt in the cool yard 
Uh, everybody would bring the eggs and hide them. And Easter Sunday, I'm afraid none of us ever heard whatever the preacher said to us because we were so busy waiting for the Easter egg hunt. But that was a big deal. We didn't have many things to do. I mean, there was, there was no video or television or anything like that. You made your own playthings. <laughs> And some of the, we, we did once a year, we got a doll to play with, and that was about it, or paper dolls. And I did one of my favorite stories my mother has on me was cutting out uh, Sears and Roebuck paper dolls and uh, getting mad, and we didn't know cuss words, and so we'd go, cuss, 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 cuss. And uh, that was what, how our paper dolls got vented their anger. <laughs> But anyhow, uh, like I said, with the mosquitoes like it was, we had to play anything we could inside. How did you get, uh, uh, when you started uh, school over uh, here in Titus, okay. how did you get here? Well, to start with, my brother and my sister, there was no way of getting to Titusville by bus. My mother had to board them with my grandmother. Well, my brother was 12 years older than myself, so he got two years of high school, and mother had to let him drop out because he just wasn't doing anything. <laughs> and he ended up joining the CCC camp. But anyhow, my sister Laura did that for one year, but then we lucked out. Carl Battle and his wife both owned school buses, and they bid on and got the job to carry us to school. And what they did, they could not drive these buses across the little narrow wooden bridge. They had brought their buses up by way of Oak Hill down and parked them at Allenhurst or Hallover Canal. And they would drive their car there every morning and they would start picking up the students. And they went from Allenhurst to Clifton to Shiloh up to what they call Shiloh Point, which is almost Oak Hill and then back down and picked up everybody at Scottsmore and Mims and on to Titusville. In other words, to go to school, we left at seven in the morning and got to school at nine. To come home in the afternoon, we got on the bus at three in the afternoon and got home at five. Did all my homework on the school bus though. <laughs> but that, I mean, that, we just felt like we were just so lucky to be able to go to high school that way. And uh, you attended Titusville High School? I graduated from Titusville High School the year after the war started, yes. What year was that? 42. The war started in 41, didn't it? And yes, this, it, uh, I graduated in 42. Uh -huh. And um, then the year before I graduated, my dad and mother had a chance to buy a house here on Main Street, just a couple of blocks from where we are in the First Baptist Church here. And uh, they moved here at that time. And that, unbelievably, at that time, they bought this wood frame house for $1,000. And it was on, sitting in the middle of great big four lots, you know, but that was, it was from an uncle of mine who ran the city ice and fuel here in Titusville. You know, back then we didn't have refrigerators. Well, they, you did, but not to start with. And they made ice here in Titusville out where the, on Tropic Street, where the uh, Florida Power and Light is now. And uh, one of the biggest thrills was to go to my uncle's floor, uh, city ice and fuel and go in the ice house where they made ice because it was cold. <laughs> Oh, yes. My grandfather's name was James Golightly. And now they were from Kentucky also, but they moved to here in Titusville. And he had a little fish market. Well, it would be where the causeway is now, but at that time that was just the wooden bridge that went across the, uh, across the river. And it was called Dad's Fish House, and you could walk from the foot of the bridge out on to the little fish house to buy your fish. And you're talking the location is on Garden Street. Yes, except it wasn't Garden Street then. It was the end of the Old Dixie because there was no US-1 coming that way. Old Dixie came. Old Dixie was part of what Garden Street is now. <laughs> and so it would have, you would have gone, 
curved around on the old Dixie and gotten on the bridge there and then gone across the river. It was almost a mile and a half, I believe, that it take to, took to go across that river there. And it was a little narrow wooden bridge that you had to very carefully meet another car on <laughs> because it wasn't very wide. <laughs> uh, what, what time period was this? Uh, this would have been in the 1930s. Uh huh. Because. Uh, uh, tell us something about Dummett Grove. Okay, that is interesting to me. Um, the people seem to think that Dummett built this castle, which he did not. Dummett had a grove, and he was the one that started the orange groves and found that in between those two bodies of water, the uh, trees did not freeze, and he, in other words, and people would get all their bud material all from there. But after his death, this Castilla, I think his name was, built that Dummett Castle, and that was what was still there when I was a little girl. And of course, we were scared to death of it. We thought maybe it was uh, haunted, but it wasn't. My best girlfriend lived there, the Reagan family, and there was, I think, four girls and four boys, something like that. Do you remember their names? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Abby and Susie and... Sam and Richard and Robert and Lemoyne. And that's as far as I can go right now. <laughs> I have the picture of them in the little, the little school bus where we, that we used to ride. But anyhow, they would have square dances there and we would all go and square dance. That was the one thing that we did have about once or twice a year. And we would go to this Dummett what was the Dummett Castle at that time. And uh, uh, the interesting thing to me was that this family were what we would call squatters because if they had lived there two more years, they could have claimed it with squatters' rights. But the woman who was a, uh, uh, what would you say, of the family? Heir. An heir to this property, Mrs. Drennan, she came back and claimed it, and they had to move. And so they built a little house just a little bit farther north than where they were. But like I said, they almost, almost owned that thing, and they lived in it for years. I don't remember how long. But at the time this Ms. Drennan came in, she wanted to do a history on it, and she wrote this history up and had my sister Rosemary go to Stetson University with her to give a speech about the Dummett. And that's where we got a lot of our history about the Dummett Castle, <coughs> was her doing that. Uh, what did it look like inside? Do you remember? Not really. Was it wood? Yes. Yes, because the, uh, and, and unfortunately, that's the reason it burns so quickly. In fact, I think these, ra these big round uh, si two sides, wasn't it part of a mask of a ship that was supposed to have gone into part of that? It was, the, the, the middle part was just one story, and that's where we danced, and that's where I was most of the time. The two sides, it had a stairway, but it was a circular stairway like a lighthouse would have that you went up. And that's what we were really afraid of because they told us that it was haunted, and if we went up there that something, you know, and we were reasonably sure that we didn't dare go up those stairs. And, of course, my mother would not let me spend the night there with my best girlfriend, which I could not understand because my best girlfriend, Abby, lived there, and she would spend the night with me. But I found out later that some of the older ones made moonshine in the grove. And my mother did my mother was a teetotaler. She didn't let us spend the night there. And I can see also with as many boys as they had. But I didn't see it at the time. Uh, do you remember <clears throat> if it had a porch or a screen? Yes. Or uh, on the back side where we look at it from, from the road, there was not a porch. But on the front side that overlooked what would be the Indian River, it had a big wide porch, and some of the pictures even show that. And there was also a little building, what did they call that, where they sat out in red and what have you. Uh, 
there's pictures of it at the museum, I know of this. In fact, uh, there's even a well still left to the south of this building uh, that was one of the original wells, called it a Menorah well or something to that. Uh, what did you, how did you? A Menorchian well, right. And it was still there when my nephew went to write up a write-up on this because he took pictures of it and also of this little building that was outside and the whole thing. Because when this Mrs. Dummett came in, uh, Mrs. Drennan came in and rebuilt on that, she even put on the copper roofing that was supposed to be like the original roofing was. And unfortunately, years later, after someone went right at one time, I don't know whether it was when, after the government bought it or what, some men were caught over there trying to strip the roofing off of it because it was a valuable thing, you know. Because I know one time my daughter skipped school and she and a group of kids went over there and she later told me where she had been. And I said, Sherry, do you realize that those men were trying to strip that roofing off? And if you kids had gotten over there when they were doing that, they'd have probably killed you and nobody would ever even known you were over there. <laughs> do, you remember, did you, uh, do you remember what the kitchen was there? The kitchen? Yes. What, what were the rooms inside? Downstairs on one side was the kitchen, and it was just your old-fashioned kitchen, you know. Uh, did it have beadboard in it or in the walls? Or I, I, don't, I just don't remember. I was, I was too young at the time that I was in there, and I, was, and I was never in it after the woman came back and remodeled it. So I don't, I don't really know. Do you remember seeing the old chimney out there? Of yes, Washington? there's a picture of that also uh, in uh, the historical things that we had gotten back of, that, uh, of the chimney. But now I believe that chimney, that chimney, well, that was from Dummett's. That's right. That was for when Dummett himself had built his uh, cottages there because all of what he had had burned down and uh, like I said, the castle that you're talking that we're talking about, that later the government moved over to the causeway and it burned there and lost a history that can never be returned. Uh, do you remember anybody mentioning about the graves that were in the Dummett Grove? No. Now that's something that I didn't know anything about was the, the graves in the Dummett Grove. But I probably, in something that I have read in that was the Dummett himself, his wife was killed by Indians, I believe, uh, in, in one of the stories that I read on the history of that, and he buried her there. And, of course, he had one son that was buried. But, of course, now part of the Dummett family was also buried up nearer the uh, New Smyrna area there so where... Uh, right, uh-huh. So, I mean, it, it, uh, nothing of this was ever really written down, so it's just people just kind of grabbing out of the blue sky to find out what some of the stuff that has been written up. And a lot of it I've read, and I can't remember all of it. <laughs> uh, what happened... Uh, what happened to the uh, uh, to the fish camps? Uh, uh, it was uh, what was the name of, of Speedy's, Speedy's well, Tavern, uh, and uh, uh, what was the name of the fish camp? Well, now Speed uh, the fish camp that uh, you ask about Speed uh, um, Speedy did that after the war. And so I, that was after we had moved away from that area. But that Beacon 42 was in back of my dad's orange grove, and that is where the original Campbell and Jackson colored people who were, uh, really, uh, they had, their families had been slaves, and they ended up in that area and buying up acres and acres and, and living off of the land over there. And they had some of the most wonderful gardens you ever saw. They had Vidalia onions before we ever knew that there was a Vidalia to grow onions. <laughs> but, uh, but then Beacon 42, that was put in after the war also. And it, it was a fish camp that was quite popular, but that would have been in the 1950s. 
Because like I said, we moved from up there in the 40s. So it was, I was there from 27 until 40. Uh, what was early Titusville like after you came here during the war years? Uh, during the war years, when we came back, of course, all there was to Titusville was the one downtown street there. And uh, you, you could walk downtown and up one side and down the other and down to where the post office, which was before you got to where the post office is now, that was Titusville, period. And the house that I now live in across the railroad track here, that was considered almost out of town. <laughs> but um, there was a, we did have a wonderful theater, which is now, of course, the Jess Parish uh, Theater that they do plays in. But where we are here now at this First Baptist Church, which they started services here in the 50s, or 60s, but anyhow, originally right behind this church was the original Baptist church, which actually came from the LaGrange church uh, with the Chidoins and all of those families. And that is where I joined and was baptized, was in the little wood frame church that was right in back of this church that now faces Main Street, but that church faced Palm Avenue. And uh, the only reason that it had to be torn down was termites had gotten into it, unfortunately. It's too bad, but it happens in Florida sometimes. What was your pastor's name at that time? I, at that time, was, uh, when they moved into this big church, his name was Hardin, Dr. Hardin, and he was here. But before that, we had Dr. Alston and... Uh, he was the one that went to Shiloh. And we had two or three pastors that was called and that went into the service during World War II also. So, Con yes, Reverend Conway was at this church at one time. Because we only had one Baptist church, one Methodist church, Episcopal, Presbyterian. That was, we had four churches in Titusville and the Catholic church. That was it, period. Johnson had the billiard hall over on the west end of the Emma Parish? I don't remember. I remember everybody talking about it. Uh, but Bert Johnson did have, uh, and I, 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 you know, when you're young, you don't pay attention to things, a lot of things that you do when you get older. Uh, do you remember where some of the uh, Bill, do you remember Jimmy the Greek's restaurant? Oh, right yes. There? Tell us about Jimmy the Greek's restaurant. <laughs> well, it was, Jimmy the Greek was the only really restaurant we had in Titusville. And, where was it located? Uh, next to where the, um, oh, it was underneath the uh, hotel that's Walker there. Hotel. Yes, uh -huh, underneath where the Walker Hotel is. And uh, Jimmy had, I think, six girls. And he said he was going to have a boy. And when he finally had a boy, that was the end of it. But he had a, a, a whole bunch of girls, because I remember that. Carantinas, yes. Uh -huh. And what were, what were the specialty of the restaurant, do you remember? You know, we didn't eat out that much. But now, when I first got out of high school, I worked at what was called the Deluxe Diner that Mrs. Nelson ran. And uh, it was where the coffee shop is now at the Baldwin Shopping Center is where it was located. But it was made out of two railroad cars put together. And that's the reason it was called Deluxe Diner. And uh, I waited tables there. I was 16 and just out of high school. And uh, during the war, of course, we, we gave the meals to the servicemen. And that was what, when uh, that uh, bu uh, bus went off of the bridge and so many of the boys were drowned, those were the boys that came and had breakfast that we served breakfast to every morning. So it was a sad time for us when we lost the boys. And of course, I was 16. I, didn't know there was anything but boys at that time. And I am almost afraid to say what I made. 
I made $5 a week in meals, but that was the way waitresses and whatever tips you made. But honey, if you got a tipper that made, gave you a quarter, you had a big tipper. Most of them, it was a nickel or a dime, if you got anything at all. <laughs> uh, uh, as a young teenager, what did you do for entertainment in Titusville? Well, for entertainment in Titusville, uh, down in Indian River City, they had what was called Clark's Corner. That's where we had our proms and dances and everything. And approximately where was that located? At the end of Route 50, right, uh, built out onto the river. And uh, then we also, occasionally a skating rink would come in and put up uh, on Sand Point and we would skate. But mostly, I mean, there was baseball and of course, I was a drum major and a cheerleader and just anything that made a lot of racket that I could get into, I was into it. Uh, but of course, when we lived over on the Grove, uh, I either had to spend the night in town to go into any of those things. Uh, and I had my best girlfriend would let me spend the night at her house. and I, always admired Mrs. Thorne. I don't know why she put up with us. She never knew when she went to call the girls how many was going to be in her daughter's bedroom that morning when she came for us. But Do you remember a denim store? Oh, yes. Denim's was right across from Pearl's Beauty Shop. And when I, after I stopped working at the diner, I went to Jacksonville and took a beautician course and came back and worked for Pearl, who had a beauty shop which is right, which was, would have been next to where the Renaissance restaurant is now, and has just recently been torn down, and they're making an outdoor thing out there for that. But anyhow, that's where Pearl's Beauty Shop was. And Denham's store, which is now Keebler's Cobbler, is right across the street from it. And then, of course, we had the F&S department store, and we had Pritchard's Hardware, and uh, Ford's Hardware, and where Renaissance is now was Frank's Bar. And I was never in there because women weren't allowed to go into bars. At that point, you kind of looked the other way when you walked by, but you knew what it was. They had a pool hall in there, and uh, a lot of the men hung out in that area. And then down on the corner, as Mr. Ford had a hardware, I mean, it's almost hard to remember what all was there when you look back on it now. There was a feed store. But at one time, there was buildings where that vacant lot is across from the Pesh, Jess Parish Theater. Now, there was also a beauty shop in there because Nan Barnes had her shop, and I worked there after I had my children, after I had one child. But then when my children got to be teenagers, I built a shop onto the side of my house so I could be there when they come home and had that for 40 years, so. Do you remember when the train used to come through here? Did you ever ride it? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Where did you go? Well, <laughs> I don't really remember going much of anything, but when my son was at uh, Cub Scout age, they had a thing on trains, and so they took us by bus up to New Smyrna and they let all the Cub Scouts go through the train uh, roundhouse up there where they turn trains around. And then we got on the train and rode from New Smyrna to Titusville. And the kids, of course, they let us walk from one end to the other to tell us how the trains worked. And the kids swore they walked all the way to Titusville. Because then I also, I, I say I didn't ride it much. When I took my beautician training in Jacksonville, I came home every two weeks by train because it was during the war and the buses, well, I rode the bus a few times, but most of the time you had to stand up all the way from Jacksonville. They were so crowded with soldiers at that time. Do you remember how much the trip cost? wasn't very much, <laughs> around a dollar to two dollars, I'm sure, because I don't remember, no, I don't. I know I, Jack Williams, who was a barber here at that time, also had a barber shop in Jacksonville, and I sometimes rode with him because he was coming home at the same time I did, and that is Pearl Williams was his wife who had the beauty shop that I worked for here. Uh, going back over to yeah. uh, Clifton. Right. Uh, what did uh, what did people do when they became ill? 
<laughs> Over in Clifton, if you got ill, you better know how to take care of it yourself because we had no doctors. I, I was never to a doctor in my life until I was a grown. Uh, if you got a bee sting, daddy chewed up some tobacco and put it on the bee sting. If you got a burn, you used milk like to put on it. I know I got a bad sunburn one time. Too bad we didn't know about aloe back then because we grew aloe, but we didn't know it was so good for burns. But we just, and fortunately, living out like that, you didn't have the illnesses, I guess. At least I never had any illness in school because I didn't catch things that when, when they went around, they weren't brought back again, you know. <laughs> because when my children brought home the measles and the mumps and the chicken pox, I took them from my children as a grown person. Don't ever do that, that's terrible. What did you use kerosene for? <laughs> oh yes, dad used kerosene for everything. He thought that that was the, and it was good. If you could take the smell away from it, it'd have been wonderful. But I know my sister fell off of the bicycle on that slag road and he just chewed her up and daddy literally bathed her in kerosene. The only thing is he made the mistake of wrapping it in cloth and it blistered. So don't ever wrap kerosene <laughs> in a cloth, it'll blister. But it is very good for a lot of things. <laughs> and you took it by the spoonful for several Some people did, took it by the spoonful for a medication. We never did take it that way. <laughs> We use it externally only, thank goodness. <laughs> Did you ever hear of the use of spider webs? They said that, what was that? that they put that on some kind of wounds, didn't they? Just bleeding. To stop blood, right, right, yes. Uh -huh. They put it on to stop blood, right. Uh -huh. uh, when you were in Titusville, coming back to Titusville, when you were in Titusville in the, uh, during the, uh, war years. Do you remember when the war, uh, when the news came that the war was over, the street died? Oh yes, uh, when, when the war was over and it came across the railroad, of course we could hear everybody, the horns started blowing and the whistles started blowing and in old downtown there's quite a few wonderful pictures that was taken right in front of the businesses in Titusville and of course by this time we had quite a few servicemen from Banana River. In fact, quite a few of our girls found husbands that way. Uh, You're referring to the Banana the Banana River, uh -huh, right, and uh, so they, it was just more or less shouting and this, that, and the other. Because uh, now I had my child, because my, my husband had gone overseas and uh, my, had my little boy, so I was more or less at home. But my son was 14 months old before his dad ever saw him because he was in Germany when he was born. Did your husband come home from the war? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, he came home from the war and he was one of the lucky ones. But, uh, uh, is there anything else that uh, uh, from the old days that you can uh, reminisce about that you'd like to include? <laughs> I'll probably think of several things I need to tell after I get home, but <laughs> right now my mind is gone. I, I think I've talked you all to death, haven't I? <laughs> I think it's probably time for me to give Aileen her time. Mm -hmm. Haven't I just about used up all my time? Yeah, well, we thank you for coming today. <laughs> oh, if you think of anything else, you can ask me later. Okay, thank you so very much, Francis. <laughs>